What a great lesson, seeing the invisible. My name is Jill Morricone. On Thursday's lesson, we look at still faithful when God cannot be seen. And for this lesson, we go to one of my favorite Old Testament books. What is that? It's the book of Isaiah. We're going to Isaiah chapter 40. We studied Isaiah a few quarters ago, and if you recall, Isaiah is really divided up into two books. We have book one, which is the book of judgment. This is chapters 1 through 39. This would be present day, Isaiah's time. Then we have book two, which is the book of comfort. This is Isaiah 40 through 66, and this is actually prophetic, looking forward to the future to when the children of Judah, Israel, would be released from that Babylonian captivity. And this is the crux of really of Isaiah chapter 40. We see the main argument in this chapter is that God can do it. He can make the second exodus happen. That's the release, the return after Babylonian captivity. He can end the exile. He can defeat the oppressors. Mm. The theme of the passage, we see the mercy of God. God wants to save his people. Our God is a merciful God. Amen. And we see the power of God. Our God can save us because he is able. Let's look just a little bit at that mercy of God and the power of God, and then we'll get into the meat of the lesson, which is my favorite part. The mercy of God, we see that in verse 1. We're in Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, this is comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry to her. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What's happening? Judah's time of judgment is over. The 70 years of Babylonian exile, that time of judgment is over. God's extending mercy and comfort toward his people. Then we see his deliverance and power. You see that in verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now this is prophetic, mm. looking forward to John the Baptist. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill brought low. Does that sound like a God of power? A God who can mm. bring the mountains low? A God who can exalt the valleys? Then in verse 9, again, we see God's mercy. O oh, Zion, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Verse 11, we see mercy again. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. You see, the exile is over. The time of judgment has ended. The second exodus can now occur and the people can come home. God keeps his promises. His word is reliable. Amen. Then we see God's deliverance and power in verse 10. We kind of skipped it. It was right between 9 and 11. Verse 10 is his power. Behold, the Lord God comes with, what's that word? A strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. His reward is with him and his work before him. Mm. Now, who is this God? Who is this God of mercy? Who is this God of power? Let's look at this God. Verse 12, this God, your God, our God is omnipotent. Verse 12, wow. who has measured the waters and the hollow of his hand? Now let's stop right there. Oh. We're talking about the ocean. That's crazy. The ocean measured in the hollow of his hand. Mm. God's hand literally can measure the oceans. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, mm. measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Seriously? The mm. dust of the earth, the <laughs> grains of the sand on the seashore. Mm. Our God, your God, can measure that. Mm. Who has weighted the mountains in scales? Literally, the mountains. You think of Mount Everest. How big is Mount Everest? Mm. How big are the mountains around the world? God takes that, puts it into a scale. Our God is omnipotent. Let's Amen. read the next verse, verse 13. Our God is omniscient. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or has his counselor has taught him? Seriously? Mm. Who has taught him? Who needs to teach God? Because our God, he knows everything. Mm. He created knowledge. With whom did he take counsel? Who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? 
who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. The, the scribes and Pharisees got just a little glimpse of the knowledge of Jesus when he was 12 years old and he was in the temple and they were like, who taught this boy? And that's what Isaiah is saying. Who taught God? Nobody, because our God knows everything. He's omniscient. Right. Let's read verse 15. Behold, the nations are a drop in a bucket. This is our God is sovereign. His authority is absolute. They are counted as dust on the scales. The nations of Russia and China and the United States of America, the nations we think are superpowers in the world today, they're nothing. They're a drop in the Amen. bucket. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its be sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are nothing. Mm -hmm. They are counted by him less than nothing and worth, worthless. All right, now. Let's look at verse 18. Our God is without compare. To whom will you liken God? How do you even compare God? Mm -hmm. To whom, what likeness will you compare to him? Certainly not to idols of gold. Mm -hmm. Certainly not to idols of silver. Mm -hmm. Our God is without compare. Verse 21, our God is creator. Have you not known? Mm -hmm. Have you not heard? Where have you been? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth, from the very creation? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. This represents God's dominion, God's power over all. Its inhabitants were just grasshoppers wow. who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. So what do we learn from this? Number one, Look at your problems against the backdrop of your incomparable God. Amen. In other words, imagine God is here. This is just for illustrative purposes. And your problems are here. And you know what I do so many times? I step in between. Remember, God's here. Mm. I'm here. I step here and I turn my back to God. And all I see is the problem. Mm. All I see is it, it seems huge and looming and insurmountable. But what if I stepped out from between here mm -hmm. and I stepped on this side? Mm -hmm. And now when I look at the problem, I look at the problem against the backdrop of my insurmountable God. And you know what I discover? Amen. The things I worry about, the things I think are such a big deal are nothing mm -hmm. in comparison with who my God is. Hey, yeah. Number two, change your focus to God instead of complaining about the present. You know, what did Job say? I cry out, help, but no one answers me. This is Job 19.7. Hmm. I protest, but there is no justice. And Isaiah said in verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim has been passed over by my God. You know, so many times all we see is the problem. We focus on that instead of turning our attention to God. Don't complain about what's going on around you. Look at your Savior. That's right. Number three, yeah. our almighty, our omnipotent God reaches down to you and I who are but dust and wants to equip and strengthen us for what we endure. Verse 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, this is the God who reigns over all. This is the God who's omnipotent. This is the God who holds the ocean in the palm of his hand. This is the God who measures the sand of the sea. And guess what? He does not faint. He is not weary. He gives power to you right now. Are you weak? Are you in need of an omnipotent, omniscient God? He'll give you power. To those who have no might, he will increase your strength. And finally, number four, waiting on God will increase your power and strength. Verse 30, even the youths, they faint and be weak. Right. The young men are going to fall. But those who wait on the Lord mm -hmm. will renew their strength. Mm -hmm. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like God does not see you? Do you feel like God does not see the problems and the situation you are in? Mm. Your God sees, your God knows, and your God is going to deliver. 
Amen. Ooh, glory. Mm. Amen. I know there's a lot of distance between the end of the table and here, but I could feel the mm -hmm. conviction. Thank you, Jill. Thank mm -hmm. you. Praise the Lord for that. Isaiah 40 is a powerful passage. Mm -hmm. It just takes Psalm and Job and put it all together. I love when it says, have you not known? Wow. Well, okay. Well, let me not get into the sermon right now, but mm -hmm. Johnny, <laughs> your final thoughts. Uh. This is a lesson that's hard to let go of. Indeed, indeed. Wow. Uh, about praying in Christ's name, I'm reading to you from the Desire of Ages, page 668. To pray in Christ's name means much. It means that we are to accept His character, manifest His Spirit, and work His works. The Savior's promise is given unconditioned. If you love me, He says, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. He saves men not in sin, but from sin, and those who love Him will show their love by obedience. Amen. The lesson quarterly for Tuesday, the author says that we should make a list of areas in our lives that need the power of the resurrected Jesus. And when we finish that list, pray about this power and pray that it will be applied to all these areas of need. Amen. Amen. You know, in the Bahamas, they say, don't worry, be happy. If you are a Christian, <laughs> you can cast all of your cares on the Lord. But if you're still worrying, you haven't thrown that off. And what you need to do is get you that God box, mm. put that prayer request in there and remember, you can't carry it yourself. Amen. Amen. I would just encourage you to spend time in the Word of God, for there you discover who your God really is. Mm -hmm. 